Radio check, radio check, radio check. This is the Explorer's pod over. Four, three, two, one. I think it's. I don't know. What do you want me to say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Great. We're so stoked to have you on the show. How you been? How you feeling? And uh, you getting pretty excited to get back into the Kumba? Ah, uh, very excited. Yeah. Ah, uh, it's like feeling good. Good to get back and. Uh, start working again actually which is weird to yeah man you know a year of uh very little stuff going on which is unusual for for me personally yeah yeah us as well you know we've been uh guiding expeditions for 10 years and we do island boat expeditions here in the philippines and we do some short trips into the uh, himalayas some three peaks climbs and a few things there but We've been shut down for over a year now, so this is us reinventing ourselves. Yeah, that's yeah. great. You, are you are you living on a boat there? Yeah, we are. In fact, we, uh, you know, I took off to sail around the world when I was quite young, but uh, this year we built a floating home, and yeah. we sunk a lot into it. It was really the idea was to do sort of an Airbnb, uh, sort of high end floating accommodation. And that sort of fell out, as you know. So now it's yeah. our beautiful, uh, it's our <laughs> office and it's our home and uh, our studio, a recording <laughs> studio. Yeah. Nice. Are, you, are we recording right now or are you going to wait? And hit? Yeah, we're recording. We're rolling. Ah. You know, what we'll do is we'll cut it in when, yeah. it, when it's all cool, but probably somewhere in there we'll cut it in. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> we're rolling. No problem. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, Ryan, thank you very much for gracing our show. And uh, we are so ve- very excited to hear your stories and to meet you. And of course, to know what's up uh, with the, you know, this the coming season. up days. Yeah, for you. So uh, for our audience, I think you can you give us a little bit um, a quick background about yourself? Yeah, well, I'm pr- uh, pr- I consider myself primarily a mountain climber and guide mountain guide um so i've i've been doing kind of big expeditions i guess you'd say for going on 18 or more years now um and was guiding quite a bit back in the day in the early early years when i was kind of in my late 20s and early 30s and then started uh my own company with a partner dave elmore um back in 2005 mountain professionals. Cause we were, you know, like a lot of people we were just like, Hey, we're, we're working for other people. It's great. You know, that, that lifestyle, uh, just guiding and instructing mountain mountaineering stuff. I was, we were both down in Patagonia and Chile and Argentina working for, um, doing, uh, mountaineering trips and stuff. And so we were just like, someday we should start our own company. And sure enough, we ended up doing that. So, you know, for a little while I would do make ends meet by guiding for other people. And then we slowly get our business going over, you know, many years because mm-hmm. it takes a while to get established. And then, sure. uh, yeah, then we've just been, you know, running our own expedition company for, for 15 years now. And, uh, and so I, I, I've done mostly my focus has been Himalayan climbing, not just like guiding, but also my own trips um, with partners and stuff. And so I got pretty into the 8,000 meter world and climbed a bunch of those. And um, and then later on in my career, I got into polar ski trips. And so I've been doing quite a lot of that in the, I'd say the past like five, six years, or actually a little longer than that, 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of Antarctica, North Pole trips, stuff like that. So I'm kind of all over the place and trying to actually I've done some sailing myself. And that's one of my kind of overall goals someday is to get another boat and uh, try to do some long trips on the water again. Cause I think it's one of the best lifestyles, you know, not for everyone doing the kind of living on a boat thing, but it's, I think it translates a lot to, expedition uh, mentality in a lot of ways um, just being able to live with not much stuff and go adventure and see places and end up in uh, little little towns you never would have 
known we're there unless you kind of just rock up in a sailboat or something and then you get to see a lot of cool places you never would in the in the normal travels so yeah i i'm i'm uh just kind of adventuring and guiding a lot and making it making the year yearly rounds around the world this year has been a little different not much travel at all but we're kind of getting back into it now with the spring heading back to nepal so looking forward to it yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I'm pretty stoked uh, that you're back to work. And in regards to uh, sailing, I took off to sail around the world when I was 26 years old. <clears throat> nice. And yeah, it was one of the best things. I'm so stoked I did it, and I'm glad I took off quite young. But uh, yeah. I was full on into climbing, and and <clears throat> I really wanted to sail around the world. And anyway, somehow I made that happen. I took off young, and I decided to pull the engine out of my boat. To make it a bit more challenging i read the wrong books maybe but uh yeah we've been on boats now for half half my life for about 25 wow. years so one of the great great adventures you can rock up into a place and go climb a mountain and you know yeah. you can uh, afford to live there it's yeah it's a great way to do it and it's always an expedition yeah. to the to the next place you know from one place to the other you sort of prepare like you're preparing for an expedition you're off again it's great yeah yeah so, yeah, I see. And I, I've always noticed a lot of like similarities with like a polar ski trip too, where you're using a lot of the same skill set, you know, the navigation is the same, you're following compass bearings, you're planning for um, planning your route, and you're using a lot of similar food and management techniques. And so in a lot of ways, those two yeah. Those two things have a lot of similarities that I find pretty interesting. You know, when you, even if you're just doing like a five day crossing between some islands or something, it's like a little mini expedition that you're launching. Yeah. Up. yeah. So it's really cool. Yeah. So we can help you out in that area. If you want some expertise, right. we'll be your consultants. That sounds good. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, let's get stuck into Everest a little bit. Let's talk about uh, this year, this season. Uh, so you're off to Nepal, you're back uh, to Everest. What's the setup this year? Tell us about your team and what's the difference this season? Yeah, well, uh, we have we have a good team uh, of seven climbers on our, our mountain professionals trip. And so it's a mixture of Americans and Europeans, and thankfully the Europeans are able to get out of Europe and travel, I guess, one way for the time being. And, uh, and you know, the, the difference this year is there's a lot of, uns- I wouldn't say uncertainty, but just, you know, we're a little, trep- little trepidations, just hoping that everything goes okay with regards to you know, the obvious problems in, in the world, the, the, yeah. the COVID issues yeah. and right. stuff. Yeah. So we're, but I think us along with some of the other operators that are going, I've been talking to a few of the other people and we kind of behind the scenes and just like, Hey, what do you think? And what do you think of this? And, and, you know, our, our mentality is, is just have try to stay a little bit more low key in, in sit, for example, Kathmandu, Sure. Um, a little less of the social side of it, not try not to go see sites and interact too much before the trip, just yeah. staying, staying in our little bubble as much as possible mm-hmm. just to get up into the Kumbu. Um, and then, you know, I don't know if you heard, but Nepal has actually decided not to make a, the climbing trips quarantine necessarily, although it's still a little bit, you know, yeah, I heard they, they changed they loosened it up a little bit. It's a bit yeah. kind of not quite sure, but I did read this morning they're trying to loosen the quarantine for climbers. Yeah. But I guess yeah, so I don't know. I mean, there's kind of there's kind of two two schools of thought in a lot of ways. I was talking to some other guides and they're we like, we're we're actually glad there's a quarantine because then in theory all the people you're up there mixing with for at least from foreigners standpoint Mm -hmm. have all been through the same hoops and tests and quarantine time. And then in theory, take that final test before flying up. So it gives you a little peace of mind. Um, 
but now that it seems like we're not going to have to do it, mm -hmm. um, you know, and still you're going to have to land with a negative test before coming to Nepal, have some days there and then take another test before you can fly up into the Kumbu. So, yeah. um, is that a 72 prior before you get in? So yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah, I think, I think it'll be much the same as Everest expeditions, hopefully um, from a standpoint of all the other normal things that we kind of do with groups. But my, my guess is it'll be a little less uh, interactive between teams at base camp, maybe um, people staying a little bit more in their kind of in their, in their own base camp. <laughs> And, and and I guess what I've been thinking a lot with our group is let's you know let's try not to have too much interaction with any trekking groups as well that are coming, which you tend to try to do anyway because you don't know you don't you also run the risk of just catching colds and sure. things from and, and that's outside. Here is just a base yeah. camp every year anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. The mountain yeah. is a. Uh very you know, the the percentage and the the room for recovery if you get sick you know it, yeah it gets, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 so, that's it's gonna be tough because yeah. even on a normal everest expedition year i mean it's not uncommon for pretty much everyone on a group <clears throat> to some point get a little get catch a little sickness of some sure. sort it's whether it's little, you know. yeah yeah so, so it's gonna be tough just to be like okay are they what do we do in this scenario do we you know kind of isolate people do we yeah uh, you know how everyone every year somebody's got the kumbu cough yeah, you know what i mean yeah. so you're gonna go oh, oh yeah. is that covid yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. no, it's be just right. just like you do here i mean i, I when i have friends oh, really? here in boulder you know as soon as someone says like hey let's get together like just close friends Mm -hmm. for a barbecue or something but then as soon as someone doesn't feel good Shuts we all go hey you know what maybe it's not a good idea just because right. everyone doesn't know these days so yeah, it's yeah. Kind of strange, <laughs> times. strange times yeah. so ryan you're flying out um to nepal what's your schedule and any particular worries right now um so i'm going uh, i usually go west through thailand um, typically but because thai airways is kind of not really working at the moment um mm -hmm. and, and there's not there's a lot less good flights into Kathmandu than in normal mm -hmm. years right. most people are going on qatar through doha okay uh, yeah and or like emirates or turkish air and so i'm going chicago to Doha, Doha to Kathmandu. And ironically, I have like three of my clients on the flight with me over to Doha. Oh. And then and then two Norwegians that are also on our team are getting on in Doha. So we're just like five of us flying into Kathmandu on the same flight. Cool. Okay, that's cool, yeah. So you have a pre-flying yeah. session in the plane? Yeah. <laughs> Well, in, yeah, in a normal year, there. excellent. You can yeah. get out of uh, talking and talking. <laughs> cover some issues. Yeah. Well, a good thing is I, and, and one of the difference, with my company, we tend to have, because it's not a, you know, uh, we're a big on scale. Like we do a lot of trips all over the world, just as any of the kind of larger guide services do. But it's it's a little more of a smaller, um, maybe boutique style where. Yeah, we we actually know a lot of the people. I mean, all the people on this expedition, we we know from past climbs, and they've wow. done you know five trips with us, or this may be the se seventh trip. So I I actually know all the clients on awesome. the trip very well. Yeah, so. that makes it real comfortable. Yeah, it makes for a good trip. Yeah. yeah. Hey, so I saw you on uh, Alan Arnett's interview the other day, and. Uh, I was sort of saw him ask you a question about the Nepalese Department of Tourism. You know how they they set uh, new rules and on visitors. Uh, he didn't allow you to 
answer the question, but so I'm going to ask it. So you know how they're saying uh, they may not, you're allowed to take photographs and videos, but you're prohibited from sharing them without permission from the department. My thought is like, what, how are you going to manage this and how will you brief your team? How are you going to go about this? It's tricky for sure. Yeah. I mean, um, there's, for someone that's been to Nepal a lot, um, I, I, you know, the, the diplomatic answer is, is we're, we'll do whatever they right. re- re- request us, right? It's the ministry of a country, and we want to respect that. Yeah. But uh, we also, you know, it's so secret that sometimes the that, that government office is a little bit, just throws out stuff late in the game or, is it really going to get enforced? I don't know. Or how can they enforce it? So yeah. I, I mean, the reality is, is they did that mostly because they don't want yeah. um, certain queue. kinds of pictures yeah, that are you at the summit or those shots. Yeah. Or, yeah. So <clears throat> I, I don't think there's much, um, I don't think there'll be, uh, too much of a difference of what people post. I, I for yeah. my group, we'll probably just you know make, have a little talk about it and say, let's not take any pictures that would uh, right. be you know, exactly something that the ministry doesn't want to get out. And and I don't think you know people really do it that much. It's just that it's happened a couple times recently, and and that's what's kind of made the problems. But uh, well, the whole- so I, I think. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 it's kind of hard to not take pictures of other people on that route, you know, when there's there's people and on the road. It's a lot of promotion know. going on, not just for you, your team, your business. It's sort of a, a way we all sort of work into our business uh, social sort of contracts. But yeah. It also is a cross promotion. It promotes Nepal. So uh, yeah. I'm guessing it would really affect them in the long run as well. So it's sort of a strange one. It, it'll, it'll get figured out this year, I'm sure. So, but an interesting yeah. take on the news. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think it's I think it's really just let's not take the pictures that give Everest a, yeah. the the name that it gets in the main sometimes yeah. with mainstream media, which isn't really a total um, realistic story yeah. of that mountain anyway. Yeah. It's it's sometimes certain pictures um, get distributed to to uh, people that are just reading general news and then they get that idea of that the mountain has all these problems that may not really be a problem when you're there. It just seems like it when it, it gets sent back out into uh, a mainstream source. Yeah, yeah. it all so. beca- also depends on the season and the wind, weather. Yeah, weather and a lot of things. Sure. Yeah, very, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. I have another question. I'm, I'm curious about uh, the vaccines. Are vaccines now required for all tourists, climbers, and trekkers? How does that work? Uh, no, not, not required. Um, just because the, you know, some, so many countries are still right. sl- in the, the process. Of Canada. They, they don't even have yeah. it yet, right? Yeah. Right. I, I, I personally am vaccinated. I got my my uh, second round um, on Monday, so um, I was lucky to get in early and early to, yeah, to even, get even in the up. states. It's hard to get uh, to get in line, yeah. Here, right? So yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was I was able to get on a, a little bit earlier um, queue because of having a first responder certification. And so I was able to get in with that grouping in the U S. So that was pretty fortunate to, to be able to do that. Cool. All right. So Ryan, you have seven climbers on your team. Uh, How many climbers uh, are expected in Everest this year compared to 381 registered in 2019? Yeah, I think uh, I've heard a few numbers. I've heard, most commonly thrown around has been 300 foreigners. Uh, I think it may be a little more than that now. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. 
Um, so I think it'll still be less than the big year. Like not, I guess not 2019 was the year there was 380, uh, Anything less than that's good. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, well, we heard we heard there are two princes who are going to climb, are going to attempt the summit: Bahrain and what's that? Oman or Qatar? The oh wow! Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Not yeah, sure. yeah. The so there's a huge army there. I think that's what's going to happen, but I'm not sure. That's so, a team of eighteen. Yeah, yeah. It, it's two princes, and okay. the other prince is going to yeah. be the base camp. Right. That's what we heard. So. Yeah, so it'll be yeah. a big group. So there's always something there, you know. <laughs> even, and a lot of the stuff you don't hear, you don't even, or I, I don't know because I don't, kind of in a lot of ways, I don't care much about all that stuff yeah. until then you get to the base camp and you're like, oh, you know, Madonna's here climbing. And, you know, <laughs> you just, here. just ran, randomly you find out this stuff right. in base camp. So well, we're different. gonna we're gonna um you know get in touch with you when you're there, so we know what's going on with the ground underground. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Oh yeah, do they have? I, we did read they have five G up at base camp. Is that is that true? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, there's, and you know most most people we use the this Everest link is a like a Wi-Fi hub system that they've set up. Um, mm -hmm. a little company that kind of manages it. They put up little, little routers throughout the camp. And um, so we can just buy scratch cards and, and use Wi-Fi there, mm -hmm. um, which is nice because we, in the past, we, we would all uh, take our own hubs for Wi-Fi and we, like, we still do take ours in case um, like a Thoreo mm -hmm. IP plus. So um <laughs> The, the problem is, is that data was really expensive to buy. And you, you always had to, you know, pretty much get an unlimited package because you want people to be able to just use it and not be tracking right. all this data and stuff. And that was extremely expensive for a group. Um, so most everyone has just transitioned to, so their teams just get these scratch cards and you can use the Wi-Fi base camp. Sure. So yeah. it makes, makes it easier. Yeah. Excellent. What's yeah. your approach to base camp this year? Will you trek from the Kumba or from Lukla through the Kumba, or are you going to use a helicopter? Is time a factor here? What's up? No, no, we'll just do the normal trek. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's really valuable to yeah. to walk up. Um, you know, the climatization is really key um, for arriving to the base camp, having those days slowly ascending through the, through the altitude, feeling good. Um, I think it's a, it's really challenging for people when they fly yeah. to yeah. the higher villages and just like step out. And then, you know, sometimes it has like the reverse effect. Yeah. You, gotta you, go you think down. you're, yeah, you think you're saving all this stuff and then you, you get out and get sick and then go have to go down and rest for five days somewhere. Yeah. So, right. yeah, I think most, most people do trek. I mean, it's pretty rare. Some, sometimes people will take helis into Namche or something or a little higher. Yeah. There's but, that just above Namche there. Yeah. Yeah. But still yeah. for me, I don't know. I think I would rather <laughs> trek yeah. from the Kumba every time. But, yeah. yeah 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 i guess it would depend yeah. as well like if you get uh with your season right now and you end up and you do get stuck in a quarantine this could change a few of those aspects for some people as well yeah 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 i mean that, that's originally we we um uh, our team we usually start our trips on april 4th in Kathmandu. i've i've kind of slowly pushed it back i mean it used to be we'd arrive march 30, 30th. Um, okay. And over time, I've just seen that as the rope fixing has become more efficient, um, the, the ice fall doctors get there so early, the, the route gets fixed. Going so early is a little uh, counterproductive because it, then you're just sp spending more days in, in base camp. Uh, so we've slowly like pushed our start date back Okay. Day, you know, a day here, a day there until now it's April 4th, but 
um, because at the time we thought we were going to have to stay in Kathmandu mm. six days extra. Right. We just, we kind of pivoted and told our team, Hey, let's arrive on the 1st of April. And then we just, cause we just don't know what the quarantine is going to look like. Um, but now they've, in, in theory, it's not there anymore. So we're just well, starting on April 1st, but that's fine. Yeah, you were saying yeah. that they've got good Wi-Fi up there now. Um, I'm sure you guys have a bit of a campaign. How do people uh, follow your trip this year on Everest? Uh, well, we send news news to our site on our, on the Mountain Professionals news page. And, and then, like most people, it's just kind of transition to social media, which is a little more efficient way to just show people what, what you're doing day to day. Yeah. Uh, you know, it used, used to be when that wasn't as big of a part of expedition life. Um, you may, you may write like a news blog once yeah. every right. week or two weeks and just say, Hey, we did all this stuff. It was great. And here's like one picture. Um, <laughs> we did that. But nowadays you can't do that. You got to be like sending yeah. stuff content all the time mm-hmm. just to be showing what it's like and and uh yeah so it, it'll be pretty interactive i mean we're we're actually doing a few cross promotions with some sponsors that i have um so we'll we'll be doing some cool just you know showing some cool scenes from the base camp and the climb and um showing you know, what it's like and how we use some product, you know, solar companies. And even I have a beer sponsor. So we're going to have some uh, nice beard or puja ceremony, at ba- you know, base camp for climbing. And, and they're all <clears throat> doing giveaways. So it's kind of cool. That's right. Yeah, we'll be sure to, we'll be, we'll be we'll watching be following and following you. you on that. Yeah. And we'll probably plug in, uh, if we can, we'll embed your Facebook on your show page as well. So people can check it out yeah so what yeah um you you mentioned that uh, this uh your climbers this season are mostly if not uh, all of them are repeat uh climbers or you know clients of yours and you know them at a certain level and i think that is really very good because the chemistry and you know um uh, yeah, the chemistry is very important, especially up in the mountain in harsh conditions. But in general, when you're leading and organizing um, and guiding expeditions, how do you deal with attitude problems of your climbers during an expedition? It's hmm. a good question. Um, <laughs> it's it 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 can be challenging on long trips, um, or of course any trip. But I've I've been pretty fortunate on my career on long Himalayan expeditions where I've been leading the trips to maybe only have a a few here and there, um, memorable people to say the least that it was, it was challenging to be kind of, uh, accommodating. Yes. Or just living with for that long, you know? Um, and I think it just, you got to rely on your professional side and just, you know, cause you, there's a, there's a fine balance of you're an expedition leader, you're a guide, but you also, there's so much time on those trips. You, you are just like hanging out a lot when you're at rest, rest breaks during yeah. uh, base camp and stuff. So it, it's this kind of balance of, um, you know, like, you know, guides wear many hats, your part-time guide, your part-time um, psychologist, your part-time uh, yeah. shoulder to cry on your part-time, all these things. And so um, that's why I think there's a hand, handful of people that have been doing it a long time. And you see the same names out there because sometimes they tend to be pretty decent at doing all those things. Um, maybe not the best at any, you know, mm-hmm. or, uh, not to say that just because you do a lot of expeditions, you're really good at it, but you know, there's, there's a reason why some people do it a lot and people go with them because they've had heard good feedback from other climbers and, you know, Hey, go with these people. Cause they are running a good product and a comfortable base camp. And, 
good mountain services and all that stuff. And to me, one of the biggest um, philosophies I always try to, to, to keep is I'm, I'm more of a, a quiet kind of expedition leader. Like I'm not barking out all these orders all the time to folks. I just try to have, um, you know, or set up a, a feeling on the team where it's a lot of good two-way communication. Like we want to hear how people are doing and what they're thinking and if they have any concerns or stuff, Mm -hmm. but somehow get to that place where they just kind of respect your decision-making without having to like talk about it much. They, they kind of just look to you to, and, and hopefully they know that you're making the best decision based on all the factors at hand and, and you're judging it by all the experience and all the years and all the time that you've spent in, in those mountains. And so hopefully they just understand like you're, you're making these decisions based on experience and the judgment that you've acquired over a long time. Yeah. And it doesn't mean it's always the right answer or the right decision and all that, but you know, that it's coming from a place where, you want the best for your people. You know, you want them to be safe and you want them to have a good su- successful summit attempt. And so when, uh, when you're making decisions on when we're going to go climb or wh- if we're going to wait a little longer or all these things, you know, that that's a good feeling when you don't have to have the big discussions and round tables and all that. It's yeah. more just a briefing like, Hey guys, this is what I'm thinking, you know, and, and I rely on my staff a lot that we we've been climbing these peaks together for a long time. So I always include, you know, my, my Sherpa team or other guides and, and, and not that it's just me saying the, yeah the final word, you know, I always bring <clears throat> Tashi Sherpa is my Sirdar. He's also an IFMGA mountain guide. So we're, we're with the people all the time on the mountain in the rotations. And so, it's good to bring in other voices and hey, what do you think? And and I like to actually kind of have the, you know, a back and forth with people right yeah, in front of the okay. client, the, yeah. the guests. You know, like what do you think, Tosh? You, you agree? You know, we'll even talk about stuff yeah. so that the people kind of feel like they're involved in hearing what we're thinking. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Very challenging. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But to answer your original question i kind of went on a yeah. random rant but yes i've had a few people over t- over uh over the oh, years yeah. that you know it's like it's a it, you just got to find a way to compartmentalize a challenging relationship and uh and and just try and sometimes it, it unfortunately it, it, yeah it makes you be more like business-like to those kind of people, you know? Yeah. So. Which sort of takes uh, out like a bit of the glory yeah. passion sometimes when you have to go, yeah. to, but you know, it's rare we find in the mountains, yeah. but it does happen. Well, yeah. it, it's all, yeah. The reason is uh, I think it's very challenging because you yourself is a, you know, considered as extreme athlete. You have done some mind blowing adventures out there and definitely your comfort zone is totally different from, your clients yeah. right yeah. so you just have to really adjust a lot and you know some some things that you think are easy may not be easy to them at all so there's true, true you, you you wear a lot of hats yeah know? we find that we've you know do as i say in some island boat expeditions and i've been on boats for 25 years and you know when the wind blows and the sea's rough i don't think about it but i do remember when i first started how scared i got when i first raised the yeah. scales you know you tend to forget that 25 years later and then all of a sudden the client's going the wind is blowing the wind the tents are flat <laughs> <laughs> and it's like so What's up? <laughs> anyway yeah. so exactly. ryan if all goes well what's lined up any further plans this year yeah how's that looking you know, I think ho- hopefully it's a, in, though 2020 may be temper my predictions for when things will be happening. You know, I learned the hard way of maybe wishful thinking yeah. early in the 2020 year where we're as a, as a, a company that's based in tourism, you know, we were always kind of like, well, this will be over by 
mm -hmm. June and we'll be able to go to this mountain. And then that would just kind of fall like a domino. And then we kept doing that all year until finally, you know, we kind of just like, okay, we're essentially going to close down shop for a little while on international things and just maybe focus on some domestic programs that are more realistic. But um, so, so for this year, I mean, we're, we're, we're kind of planning just a return, if you will, to all the destinations we typically would go to. Um, the, the exception, there's two exceptions right now, which is, and actually, I don't know if you all have heard anything that I haven't about Indonesia, but, um, you know, Indonesia and Russia are the two countries that are still closed mm -hmm. when it comes to seven summits, which is a lar large part of our business. Um, well, so we're, we'll we're, see. We're still closed here in the Philippines. Yeah. 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 So we can't, well, if we leave, we can't come back in. <laughs> right. So, and getting out of here is difficult as well. But yeah. Yeah. Different. Sorry. No, but that, so, you know, from, from a business standpoint, we, we're hopefully going to Elbrus in Russia if it's, if right. something miraculous happens and they can open Russia in the summer. But if mm -hmm. not, we'll be at Kil Kilimanjaro for a couple trips. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of domestic stuff here in the U S in the Cascades. And then, um, I, I hope we could do a Karsten's pyramid trip in mm. Papua in the autumn, but we'll, we'll see how that shakes out. But so, and then, you know, ironically, we're already talking about Antarctica for next winter. Um, and we're, we're doing logistics right now for the trips in December because, there's a lot of uh, de pent up demand for going down to the kind of Mount Vincent programs and South Pole ski trips and stuff like that. So we're already in the thick of it with reserving our places on flights and stuff like that. So, and, you know, in Nepal next autumn, I, we're going to try to have an Amit Blom trip in the autumn as well. Um, yeah. So, and, and personally, you know, I, I, I like to mix in some personal trips still because, like, there's a few objectives I have that I just have to kind of figure out when when I can do it or, you know, put it into a schedule. And mm -hmm. so I'm, I don't know. I'm thinking of some potential climbs in the Himalayas again, but I don't have any necessarily, like, yeah, concrete stuff. I'm guessing it's really tricky time because, you know, a lot of times – when you're organizing your logistics, for example, I'm guessing down to Antarctica, <clears throat> you have to go through, I can't remember the name of that company, but they only have so many seats and yeah. everybody's got to throw their down payment down beforehand. And yeah. if it gets canceled and pretty much is what I get on Everest as well is like, you got to hang on to that until next season or however that works. I guess this makes it real hard for booking trips for you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it was a, and that in those two those two places were the most you know the hardest pill to swallow from the last year mm -hmm. um, because basically the world kind of shut down right uh, three weeks or something before our Everest trip in 2020 yeah, right. and we had already you know sent all of our overhead costs mm -hmm. over to Nepal so it hurt. that. Yeah, that money has been tied up for over a year or a year now, and oh, and dude, there's going to be some money lost through that. Yeah, the for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and and also the Antarctica season, you know, didn't happen this past winter, and that's that's one of our other biggest programs. And yeah. a place I love going personally is to guide down there in, in Antarctica, and, and so when that that didn't happen. Um, it's, it's, it's hard from a business standpoint also just, you know, all, a lot of other reasons, but now that Antarctica not having a, a year happen. And like you said, there's only so many seats on the flights down for these various programs and their ALE is the company They're They're not expanding to accommodate more trips this upcoming season. So the, uh, the, the demand is kind of ballooning up right now. Right. Um, and 
So the, the deposit money and all that kind of stuff is like way in advance. Like right now, they're already saying like we need fund, you know, the, the deposit money for your clients and stuff. So yeah, which is which is also hard, right? Because there's still a lot of countries that people don't even know if they're going to be able to do stuff. I mean, and I'm guessing a lot of fear that they, you know, they can close yeah. it down again. Yeah. 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 Oh. yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's tough. And as a, as a business owner that relies on all these, um, <coughs> these things to happen and, and those two areas in specific, it, it, it's, it's quite a lot of money that's involved. And so uh, it can be very stressful. And I what I am slowly learning or teaching myself is, is just to be, you know, you got to just, try to compartmentalize that side of things and not let it just be in your head all the time. Like yeah. what if this doesn't happen? And um, we have all this yeah. money that's sitting there and cause yeah. that just ruins your personal life day after day. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's keep hoping for the best and everything keeps going uh, according to plan. Yeah. It's great. You're back to work for sure. Um, I also want to, I want to talk a little bit about uh, I want to step back in your career a bit. I want to talk a little bit about the North Pole. Um, I'm, I'm from what I've read. You've been uh, on twenty. You've been on twenty expeditions to eight thousand meter peaks. Um, and I'm thinking about your first North Pole expedition with. Uh, I think you you would probably categorize as land to pole, which you did with uh, Eric Larson. And uh, how hard is that compared to? Uh, your mountaineering expeditions, uh, your your land to yeah. pole trip with uh, Eric. Uh, it, it's 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 extremely difficult. Um, I think there's there's hard parts of both you know mountain big mountain climbing and polar ski trips, but that's that specific trip to the pole from from a, from a co with a coastal start right which has been mo El most typically El island there yeah Ellesmere. right um that trip is just it's really um a challenge and in so many ways uh and there's a reason there's only been i think it's only like 50 56 people that have ever done that um, How many? unsupported 56 okay yeah i think yeah, that's, that's the number too for how hard it is i'm and it, it's yeah i read it's quite expensive as well yeah it's crazy. yeah like the the the, the coat from the coast to the pole unsupported unassisted is um it's it's uh <clears throat> got a lot more challenges than I, I mean, for me, I always think of it as the hardest trip I've ever done personally. Yeah, okay. uh, including Everest and all these other mountains. Right. It, it's uh, it's it's day after day of a lot of hard work, danger. You're scared all the time. Um, big heavy sleds, very difficult conditions. You know, it's super cold early, especially early on in that expedition. There's polar bears. There's you know, a changing environment all the time. So it's, it, it's, it's a big challenge and, and there's no days off, you know, you're just going day after day after day. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a brutal expedition for yeah. sure. I mean, it's like you are, you are shot when you get done with that trip. And um, so I, you know, there, and of course there's hard mountains and there's hard routes on different mountains and all that but those tend to be like a hard work, sure. but then rests hard work and then rests, you know, you, you go and come and you go back to base camps and you chill out and regroup and all that. Whereas that North pole expedition is just a fight every day for, wow. it took us 53, 53 days on that trip to, mm -hmm. to uh, reach the pole from, from uh, Cape discovery. So it's and you, it, it's hard yeah were you and eric the first americans to pull that off actually the second um okay. yeah two uh two guys did it and um 
gosh, I think, uh, I don't want to say it wrong. I think it was 11 or 12, uh, may have been earlier. May have been, I feel bad that I can't remember right offhand. 2011, right after your yeah. Antarctica cross. Yeah. Year after Houston year. and Fish, Houston and Fish, they, they did it. They were the first Americans to do it. And okay. then, yeah. And then me and Eric were the second and third and the last people would have done it. Okay. So no, no one's done that trip since our trip back in 14. So mm -hmm. it's yeah. Speaking of Eric, um, you know, we, we were scheduled to have him on the show a few months back and uh, are you in touch with him currently? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So he sort of informed us about his situation, but next time you see him, tell him some, uh, you know, a lot of support from our family. With everything. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a tough time right now, well, but, uh, yeah, well, he'll, he'll be a strong guy. Yeah. We'll, Just we'll pull through. The battle. Yeah. Wouldn't want to be on that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Ryan, you did Antarctica as, um, and as an unassisted and unsupported crossing. How does the South Pole and this North Pole compare? Um, there's there obviously there's a lot of comparisons that are s similar just because of what you're doing in the environment uh and and the and the movement and the skiing and navigation all that but the 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 well i'll go back so that crossing was yeah 2009 and 10 and we that was me and <coughs> cecilia skog from Norway and we, that, that was a difficult trip because it was so long and the distance was so massive. Yeah. Uh, that, that trip took 70 days wow. to, to ski because it was such a big, it was 1,200 miles <laughs> to, to do that crossing. Um, so that the challenges for that expedition were a little bit more based on just the daily grind of how long it was the mental side of skiing so long every day and you know you just got to find this mental space to be like every day keeping your keeping your mental state kind of busy and then you go in your ups and downs and all that um <clears throat> as compared to the north pole trip which was a shorter time frame right 53 days and only basically 500 nautical miles mm -hmm. but the but the north pole is way harder yeah uh, when you get it immediately like, in the miles you can hear yeah. it right wow yeah yeah the day-to-day -day is much much more difficult um but that being said that that at that trip we did was very hard too because you know starting starting off we had <clears throat> 75 days of supplies with us so doing it unsupported means you got all that in the sled at the start so we had 320 pound sleds um that that we had a long way to go and so yeah. did you did you how did the food supply hold out in the end where were you how was that it was it was good actually on that okay yeah we we had it pretty dialed i mean we i think we so we had 70 days, 75 days of stuff with us and we <clears throat> finished in 70. Oh. So we're, we're pretty, we're fine, you know, and, and the likelihood of uh, not getting picked up at the end was a little bit less than Arctic ocean mm -hmm. because you just don't get like major super long storms where maybe they can't fly out. I mean, we could have had to wait a little while, but, yeah. Not like up on the Arctic Ocean where when me and Eric finished that North Pole trip, uh, we were luckily got to 90 degrees and we happened to be on a really big, nice pan of ice that was big enough for land a twin land. otter to land on. Right. And so that that pan of ice is drifting once you stop. And so, we, you know, by the time the plane picked us up, we were... I can't remember, but yeah. six You're miles right. away from right. the North Pole. Um, but in that scenario, we were way low on food. Um, and 
the the guys from Ken Bork, the, the flight company, were basically had already taken off to fly up to alert before we even knew it because they could see a storm coming. Okay. Yep. And if we if we weren't gonna get out on the day we actually did, you were they said they we could have been stuck there for a week. Wow. And we only had like two dinners between us left. <laughs> so that was a little bit that was a little bit more uh yeah, scary yeah. to, right. to think all the good luck with the uh, was with you. Yeah. I was I also I was reading an article and I couldn't I didn't decipher it right. But uh, did you ever have an expedition in Antarctica where you uh, didn't make it back or you've lost uh, your stove? Or was it someone else I was reading about? No. It wasn't you. Yeah, that's, I got <laughs> no. confused on that. Um, going back to the North Pole expedition, you know, as a whole, you're talking about how, how hard it is. And, but it's also probably quite a challenge in, uh, you know, just the pre uh uh, logistics. Uh, there's all kinds of conditions and circumstances. Um, what stands out as the most challenging part of that trip? Mm. Yeah, it's a it, it's a great question, but it's fun. You know, in my own head, you you relate to the 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 the, the fact that all aspects of that trip are, are difficult mm -hmm. um, from a standpoint of unless you have, are made of money, you know, it's hard to get the money for it starting off. Yeah. It's hard to pack for it. It's hard to get the logistics right, to get all the sleds up to, you know, where the, where you stay before your, your expedition. It's hard to get lucky with the weather to get flown out to the start. Um, and then the trip is hard and every day is hard and all there's danger all the time. So it, the, the joke that, a lot of people have that have done that trip is like, or at least me and Eric had was like there, we don't, you don't get any breaks on the up there. Right. Cause you keep thinking like everything's so hard. When are we going to get a break somehow? And it just never really comes. Yeah. <laughs> it's just always hard. Mm -hmm. And so that to me is the most challenging part is like, it, it starts to beat you down after, um, you know, day 40 something and you, and you still, it, you still don't know that you're going to make it. That may be one of the, the, you know, to, to your question that the most challenging things is when we were on day 50, we still didn't know if we were going to get to the pole, wow. <laughs> you know, cause, because it was, there was so much more open water than there used to be years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. So we we're, it was very slow. There was pressure ridges, which you used to not get mm -hmm. that far north, so that the the it didn't let up late, and we we're running late on time when it comes to the guys wanting to come get us off there because later in the season it's too dangerous for them to land on the ice because it, it's getting too thin. There's not good pans of ice to land on, so they had said it. A kind of drop dead date like you guys need to be there by this date or else okay. it's we're going right. to get you because it's too getting too late and we had talked them into on the satellite phone you know hey just please give us these two more days or whatever it was i forget what mm -hmm. we finally got out of them because we we were so close and we're All like right. just give us a little more time so we were kind of running against the clock um and food was low we were weak at that point just because you just are by that late in the game. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. yeah so oh, yeah. That, that, that's the challenging part is that yeah. well, being so close and you you may not even get there, yeah. you know, yeah. after all that, all well, the fight. Were, all, yeah. were there times that you thought of giving up, that you'll, you thought that you'll never reach the pole and what kept you going? There's, um, I don't think, there, there are certainly times of, of <clears throat> questioning stuff. Uh, and we, we certainly had a few talks, you know, midway of like, we're not making enough distance. 
you know, cause you just start doing the math, right? It, it, you don't do a lot of distance for the first half of the trip because it's, there's a lot of uh, bad ice for the early part of that expedition close to the, to Canada, close to Ellesmere Island. It's really a lot of pressure ridges, a lot of um, rubble ice and stuff. So it's very slow and you have very heavy sleds. Mm-hmm. So when you get midway and things start to kind of open up a little bit, you get some better days where you can actually ski distance. But you, you start looking at the math and you're like, hey, we still have all these miles and all these degrees to do. <clears throat> and we don't have that many more days left. And we, don't, we only have so many days of food. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> we definitely had, a, you know, some talks where we're like, the math's not adding up, but we never really i don't think we ever talked about not you know continuing we just took the mindset of let's just get through today let's have a good day tomorrow let's see what we can do tomorrow and and so you break break all that that trip gets broken down into like very short-term goals you can't look at the the big picture we would just start focusing on getting to the next degree of latitude, you know, like who cares about 89 right now or 90 degrees. Let's just get to 86. That's our goal, you know? And once we get there, then we can start thinking of the future days. Um, So that's, again, that's one of those hardship pieces is you don't, you have to maintain hope inside your own head even if you don't see much reward day after day, you're just like, okay, well, that was a really hard day, but at least we finally got 12 miles today, you know? And so that's, that's a victory. Let's get in the tent, do self care, eat, sleep, and get up and do it again tomorrow and see where we get. And then slowly, but surely you just keep like chipping off little pieces of that block and it adds up. And then, you get lucky some days and get like good ice where you can cover a lot of distance. And then you get a little bit of a left lifted spirit. Like, Hey, this may be possible. Let's just keep on cranking. And yeah. It's very, so, but we, yeah, it's very interesting because that mentality, like one step at a time, you know, one day at a time, it, it, it really takes you and brings you so far, farther out there you know right like works in yeah. every scenario yeah so <laughs> when, i i remember when i was uh you know i was nearing the summit um from the north side it was just like that like one step at the time so like you can see the summits like another corner there's no summit okay just one step at the time yeah. you yeah. know at, at the end it's like okay i'm here <laughs> you know but it, it was like the longest one step at the time yeah. of your life and yeah it's also the same in everyday life that you encounter, you know, you just take it one day at a time. Yeah. 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 Like, like this whole year. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to think that I, I, I do that myself sometimes on climbing, you know, when you're tired and you just kind of do that mental thing of, oh, yeah. all right, I'm just going to take 10 more steps, yeah. you know, like, let me just think of the next 10 steps and you're like, (laughs) and you do your 10 steps and then rest. And then you're like, okay, now I'm just going to get to that carabiner there. You know, like I do those little short term kind of goals. Very powerful. Yeah. Words. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. But I think I, I agree. It's like, uh, I, it's not, it's very common for people to say how being uh, on adventures, can help people deal with stuff in, in just kind of a normal life scenario, I think. Um, and I think some of the expeditions I've been on have made me mentally think of little things I have to do, uh, as problems, you know, like, I'm like, okay, here's a problem. I'm just going to fix the problem, you know, like, you got to renew your driver's license or whatever it is. Yeah. Solve the problem. Yeah. You just solve the problem. Yeah, exactly. And just like take care of it and then go to the next thing you got to do. So yeah, I think that's been helpful, you know, learning that from, from expeditions and stuff. Cool. Yeah. That's so, that's some of the questions that we've been talking about a lot, you know, bringing to our audience, you know, so that they can sort of get a feel like we've, 
I think everybody's probably gone through one of their hardest years in life this year. And there's a lot to yeah. be learned from <clears throat> a lot of the great people that we've spoken to in the last few months. So a lot to learn from those adventure perspectives. Uh, also, you know, I, I read that you fell through the ice without your dry suit on, probably, probably one of your biggest fears. What the hell went through your mind and how did your body react? What did you do? That's, yeah, um, it was weird. It, well, first off, you actually fall through a couple times, you know, pr- oh, more or less. Right. Um, but yes, one time I, I fell in, um, in like big, m- most of the time you punch through sometimes right. just, walk, you Got know, maybe it's yeah up to the knees, like yeah. your foot goes into water or whatever, but, and that's not a big deal. But yeah, the, the time you're referring to, I, I did, uh, we were crossing a lead that was frozen over, but just very thin ice. And, um, yeah, I fell through and it's funny cause I, I don't really recall the being scared necessarily, but just like knowing that my instinct took over to, I just need to get out right away you know and and get over to the edge because i was very close to the edge of good ice so i just kind of shuffled over but the danger is you don't want to lose your skis because your skis are underwater wow and yeah right so so i kind of got over to the edge and got up onto the onto some good ice and and we i mean again it's like all this stuff is thought out ahead of time because that's a very common thing to happen. People fall through on the pole trips. Um, So what do we do? Well, we have a a stuff sack and sled. That's like your emergency layer grab bag that has spare um, base layers, you know, wool long underwear and stuff. Cause the main thing is you got, you got to get out of that cloak, those base layers before they freeze. So I just finally got up and I, I really wasn't thinking of it too much. I mean, I was like sh- probably shocked a little bit, but not so scared. It was more like just, okay, now you got to take care of the problem. Now you're wet and it's 30 minus out. Crazy. So take off all the outer clothing that we ski in and change. You know, I just stripped down wow. and change into new new long underwear mm-hmm. and then we talked about it how are we doing okay you know just kind of processed it a little bit and even said well it's only like one o'clock let's just keep skiing <laughs> so so i put on my outerwear again which was like frozen stiff mm-hmm. and then we just like kept okay. skiing the rest of it right so, so it's wet it freezes up and you're just going to move through it that probably helped yeah. out the outer gear a bit i'm guessing yeah you know heat it up and get it uh moving again yeah oh wow yeah so after that there's so much experience and and we really wanted to know so with that horrifying experience what about your polar bear experience and you uh when you had <laughs> to pole expedition with yeah. eric how was that uh, <laughs> yeah that was that was scary as well um <laughs> Yeah, I bet. Yes. So, you know, commonly when, when the most common way you see polar bears on the Arctic, in anywhere in the Arctic is they circle in, you know, they'll, they'll slowly circle into something they're investigating. And so typically if you're like a polar skier, you'll see sometimes videos of people like, yeah, we can, you know, we can see this one and it keeps coming in closer and closer. And so you have time to be like, okay, if it's keep coming in closer, let's kind of, you know, get the gun. And you have like this planning thing happening as, as it's evolving. But on that particular day, we were with not to go too much into it, but some, North Pole expedition people, the way most people have done it is actually take two sleds each at the start. Oh. And because this, there's so much weight on those 
just your supplies for each person. What people often do is, is ski forward with one sled, unclip, come back, get the other one, ski the second one forward. And you do that for several weeks until right. you Loosen get that amount of stuff down. And then you just transition into your one big sled from there all the way. What me and Eric decided to do before the trip is let's not do the two sled version. Let's just each have our own sled, but just one big one each and everything in it. And so what we did is for the hard parts early on was we both would clip into one sled and ski it forward and go back and get the other sled and then bring it up. So that day, which was pretty early on, I think it was only like maybe a week or so, 10 days into the trip, we were pulling one of the sleds forward and we just stopped when we were, you know, certain distance away because you don't want to go too far away from the other one just in case like it's lost in bad weather or something and we just unclipped and turned around to go get the other sled and in our tracks was two bears walking right at us wow. just i mean i think 20 feet or so away from us mm -hmm. and so the what the instant did? reaction was throw throw your mittens off and start screwing on the pen pencil flares that we keep in our zippers of mm -hmm. the leg pant legs okay because that's the first line of defense of you're trying to scare the bears away mm -hmm. and <laughs> so scare a polar bear <laughs> yeah and so we were you know there was a few expletives we were yelling out loud sure and trying to screw these flares on as the the bear, it was a mother and like a, a teenage uh bear with the mother mm -hmm. and they were just walking at us and you know sniffing us and walking at us and we're like what's that i always remember i i like cross-threaded my uh pen pencil flare i was like oh you know perfect timing to like cross thread something no. uh, and luckily eric got his and he shot his little pen flare but they're not much they're just like a little yeah. you know like pop um and that so the, the mom stopped, but the, the teenager just kept walking at us because like they don't know, they, they have no idea what's going on. Either is the mom really. But, uh, and then I got mine screwed on, shot mine. They both kind of paused for a second. And very luckily that gave us time. Eric reached into the sled, which had the gun. We ha happened to have the sled with the gun in it with us. Mm -hmm. Oh. oh, okay. Because if we would have had the other sled, then wow. that probably would have been uh, a grim ending right there because we would have had no way to <clears throat> do anything. Yeah. So Bear we got, yeah. So Eric was able to get the gun out and the, the first shell is a bear scare. So it just shoots and it's a very big uh, explosion, like boom, and it really scares bears away. Uh so she, the mom turned and started to kind of walk away. <laughs> and I remember the teenage bear just kept walking to us because it was like looking at its mother and didn't know what to do. And it was like curious of what we were. And uh, <clears throat> then finally it turned and they both started to run away from us. And so we shot one more behind them, another bear scare, just to kind of like make sure they were Keep on going. the way. Keep going. And Wow, yeah. that was really close call. Yeah, it was it was scary. I mean, because oh. afterwards we were like just shaking and like, oh my god, talking and oh my god, oh. And you're only a week into it, like yeah. <laughs> How many more? Call the helicopter. <laughs> we're going home. More. <laughs> and they and the and their footprints were literally like ten feet is when they turned from us. So, mm -hmm. it, it, and even more scary or weird to think of was. So then after just like a couple minutes of like processing this, we we're like, okay, what should we do? Let's go get the other sled. And so we started like skiing back in our track and we, we could see that they had been walking behind us for like 200 yards. Shocking you. Shocking. Yeah. So it was like crazy to see that. Cause we we're, they, they, the mom could have just come right behind us and just hit us with a paw. Yeah. Just to kind of see what we were. And uh, that would have definitely, usually that would like kill someone if it just gives you a swipe of a paw. So uh -huh. we're super lucky in that scenario. Yeah, sounds like uh, it.
Yeah. I had a few but, I, you know, I, I mean, I know Eric had a very close call also in, in, on an earlier expedition in the Arctic with Lonnie Dupree. I think it was him and Lonnie where they had a bear. It, when they were asleep, a bear came and put its paws on their tent and just pounced down on top of them. <laughs> well, they died. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's totally out of the movies. <laughs> exactly. So it's it it's weird, yeah. But that's another one of the things of that North Pole trip is like you, then you can't you just have to like put that in some place in your head because that night you go to sleep. You, you don't know, sleep. in your tent. That night you don't yeah. sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you're just and you know that there's bears right around you yes, somewhere. Exactly. They're close. So yeah. They it, can smell you. These are the things yeah. you know, they are, these are realities. And it, before you go into that such endeavor, you you know, these are the things that you have to accept that will happen to you. So yeah, yeah. you have yeah. to put it somewhere in your mind and somewhere in your mind, somewhere that this or this can happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's scary. Super scary. But I think that's how it, that's how the like weird people that do it are can somehow just kind of put those little boxes and be like, okay, this is dangerous, but let's just do it. And yeah. I, mean, cause I, I think even like even more realistic danger is when you're pulling all those heavy sleds and stuff over ice and it's the sleds are falling on top of you and cause yeah. you're getting them over big pressure ridges and all that, which happens is like <clears throat> people get injured by their own sleds. And if you're, in the middle of a huge ru bad rubble field of ice like that you can't get evacuated from there yeah so if you really you have to be thinking of okay me if my buddy here gets injured you would have to somehow have a plan to get somewhere else that's yeah. you know open and that may not be for a long way mm -hmm. yep. um so yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's kind of the yeah. So it, you just can't think of it really. You just gotta like go forward. Yeah, that's the old, that's the old uh, deal with it when it comes. Problem yeah, have it when it's there. I mean the the best thing is like the old Norwegian guys that started all this crazy polar stuff back in the day. I mean, you know, non Nansen Norwegian. He his motto was just like go forward. Like there, there is no other option but to go forward to get to like get to the finish, um, and so that's like the mentality is like okay, there's all these hardships and challenges and it's dangerous, but I'm just gonna go forward and and you know make distance and get to my uh, get to my destination each day. Cool. Yeah, so I'm I'm curious, you know, when you spend that much time away, and uh, really, it's an ultra extreme environment, uh, an ultra extreme expedition. You are sort of uh, dropped out of society. How difficult is it to go back home and sort of get into the groove? Do you have a culture shock, so to speak? I think yeah, I think so. I, and you, uh, I mean, even from some of your trips, but. Also, I you know what I related a lot to is sailing. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced that when you have been on a boat for a long time and not around other people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you get to a marina or something, you kind of don't want to leave the boat. You're just like so used to your little place, yeah. your little stuff. And, and uh, so I think <clears throat> in a lot of ways, and even people that go on Everest expeditions or whatever it is for a long time where you're like so singularly focused on a goal <clears throat> that when it's over, sometimes it's hard for people to kind of adapt back into a normal lifestyle because you're like, okay, now everything's easy. I, I can just turn on this faucet and there's all this food in the supermarket and you kind of have lost yeah. that. You know, you walk yeah. into the Safeway and the, the lights are humming. Everything sounds yeah. good. Everything smells. Yeah, I, I remember when I, especially when I first started doing some really big passages, you know, 30 days. And, yeah. you know, it's not so profound when you land in like the Marquesas and it's jungle and it's quite wild. But if you landfall in a city and you, yeah. all of a sudden the cars are like going super fast. The grocery stores are, everything's humming. It's freaky. Totally freaky yeah. experience. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's like the sensory overload in a way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I, the, the funny thing I've noticed over my career is I can relate that back to when I first started as an instructor in outdoor education, you know, in North Carolina. And I, I would instruct like a seven day backpacking course. And, and then going into the town, I can remember having that feeling like, whoa, this is crazy to be in a Walmart. It's like sensory overload. But, but, but now, now I look back at that and just laugh, you know, like yeah. that was, that was like, it was profound at that time. Cause I was like, not used to it, but then you go on and do all these longer things. And, and it's kind of funny to like laugh at that back. You used to think that was long time to be out. And, yeah. Seven um, days, like. <laughs> yeah. Well, so. yeah. Speaking of, you know, long time, uh, can you tell us about uh, a little details about the the trip the you call? guys provide? Your yeah. trip. it's the one you guys are now providing. I saw yeah, on yeah. your website. It's also what uh, you're sort of known for: uh, the Explorers yes. Grand Slam. Explorers Grand Slam. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of a. You know, I mean, basically, that is the seven summits. So climbing the highest peak on each continent and then skiing to the North and the South pole. And what the, what the, that overall objective has kind of evolved into these days is the doing, or I should say most people are doing is skiing last degree trips to the North and South pole. Um, and that's kind of just evolved into this nomenclature as the Explorer's Grand Slam. Um, the reason I say it with kind of, you know, wishy-washy is, is that it, that term used to mean something else oh. like 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. and, that, and that term has just over time been taken into mean doing the seven summits and like getting to the poles, you know, mm -hmm most commonly on south uh, last degree ski trips, so the last 60 nautical miles to the okay. pole. Um, back when I started doing kind of big expeditions, that phrase, the Explorer's Grand Slam, was literally only one person in the world ever did it still, mm -hmm. which was Mr. Park. He was a, a Korean guy. Oh. Um, and, and that was when you climbed all the 8,000 meter peaks, skied full length, so land to pull, um, unsupported, unassisted polar trips, and the seven summits. That, that was what the Explorer's Grand Slam used to be. Uh, what, what I did, which was like an offshoot of that, was called the Adventurer's Grand Slam, oh, which okay. just, if you haven't done all the 8,000 meter peaks, so it was like, seven summits and but full length coast to pole unsupported unassisted ski trips so that that was like the grand slam was you used to have to do it from the, the coast um mm -hmm. but since that's almost not a reality anymore from north pole because th there's just not good logistics to ski from canada anymore um and the changing climate and difficult ice and you can't get flights anymore and all that stuff mm -hmm. it's it's kind of evolved into people doing the last degrees and then they say you know i've yeah. done the explorers grand slam and so that's kind of where it stands now yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. so we we yeah. we've seen a lot of you know like i think it's great because a lot of seven summit people that are have got gone down that, that road of doing those seven peaks um, they, over the past, I'd say five, six years, it's become more and more interesting or a option or whatever you want to say to where more, more of those kind of people are interested in doing those last degree ski trips, which is great. I think it's super cool and it's good for, you know, people like myself who are 
we're running up these trips to the ski into the poles um, because it's another awesome expedition to do. Mm. And, and what's, what I've seen is a lot of people that even did seven summits 10 years ago, they're still driven people. They love being on trips. Yep. They, they want that challenge again, you know, something to train for, or look forward to. And so even some of those folks that are, are going back now and like, Hey, I, I already went to Antarctica and climbed Minson 10 years ago, but I, I want to try this, you know, ski into the pole and because do the grand slam. And so that's, that's really cool. And, and for, for someone like myself, it's great because there's not, not so many guides out there in the world that are, are both polar guides and mountain guides. Mm -hmm. Um, you tend to be one or the other. It just seems to be the way it is. Um, but I'm, I'm doing both of those. And so for, for someone like myself, it's great for me that people want to do those grand slam type trips, because if they come in our system, then they can work with me on a personal level and even on the trips in a lot of cases and, yeah. to be that constant guide yeah. of like, yeah, yeah, you remember when we were climbing Everest, yeah. this is how we were doing it. But on pole, it's going to be like this, you know, yeah, um, constant, constant. so that's a big advantage. Yeah. Totally. Great. Yeah. yeah. And someone who's been there. So, well, yeah. An avalanche and Manaslu being on a hijack plane in no, Russia. I, no, I, one second. <laughs> I want to, since, yeah. uh, since we're talking about that, I want to, I just thought of something. Uh, are you familiar with um, Eriden Erk? Eruch. Er he's, he's, uh, er he's on, well, he's on his second time around, but he's, uh, he's doing the six summits by uh, human power. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, Tur the Turkish. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This guy's an uh, absolute madman. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was amazed at his first trip, you know, before he even took off the paddle across the ocean. I'm bringing it up because it reminds me of the Grand Slam, and he's a savage. But he, uh, you know, he pat he pedaled out of Seattle in the winter, goes up and yeah. does a uh, Denali, and I thought, wow, that's a hell of accomplishment. And then you know, he did the three summits on his first circumnavigation around by human power. But he's leaving on uh, Earth Day. And he's headed across to Hong Kong, which will take him a year to get to nearly a year to get to, to Hong Kong. And then he'll start pedaling towards Everest. And he's gonna... <clears throat> he doesn't have an operator yet. He doesn't have a guiding service. So I'll put yeah. you in touch with him. Yeah. He's going to climb yeah. Everest from the north. Sorry. But man, I just think about the, you know, people and the stuff they're doing. This guy's pretty hard. Yeah. Pretty hard. Uh, pretty that, hard. Cool. Yeah. That, there, there's that. That's the cool thing of the adventure world is there's, of course, there's the big things that people get a lot of eyeballs, you know, Everest and this and that. But there's there's so many people out there that are doing really cool stuff yeah. that yeah. that are it's it's just like mind blowing things, and they're not necessarily doing it for some checklist or whatever, right. and they're just hardcore and pulling off amazing expeditions. And uh, pretty, pretty, yeah, pretty cool. Stuff. Yeah yeah so so well um, let's let's go back to your crazy stories yeah let's go back, come to <laughs> well some of the lists uh, you were hijack uh, uh hijack plane the russian avalanche in manaslu uh tell us some of your craziest mishaps or close calls on your travels oh yeah. man <laughs> i mean yeah we heard the polar well, my, story. we know you've fallen through the ice we've heard about this plane in russia i mean what's your craziest story do you have one i don't i mean it's funny because I, I, uh, I was talking to some, I was doing a polar training for some people in Colorado last week. And we were talking about this topic there, mm -hmm. you know, people always want to, they're interested in this, like, what's the weirdest or the most scary thing you've been in or this. Mm -hmm. And I don't like my personality is maybe like less of the kind of British storyteller that has the, you know, dramatic story of this thing that happened to me right. and and i don't know if that's a bad trait for myself you know because sometimes it's good to be like that when you're an adventurer and uh but i've had so many weird close calls and things over the years that it I, it's funny because i number one don't think about them that much and number two uh 
they kind of, I forget about them, honestly. And, and so one of the, I'm actually writing a book right now that's right. Um, mm-hmm. almost done. It's due, due to the publisher in July 1st. So I'm yeah. getting very close to finishing, but that's been a very, very cool process, right. Of reliving all the stuff that mm-hmm. you're asking about. Like I start thinking of that time in Tibet or Pakistan or something. And I'm like, Oh my God, I got to, you know, that's, that's a story right about, yeah. yeah. To tell. <laughs> and, and, and so when people ask me like, what's your book about? I it's based on that kind of, cause I was the first American to do that true adventures grand slam doing land to pole trips unsupported unassisted and seven summits and and there's only been 12 people in the world to do that um like that grand slam or really the the grand slam with full length polar trips um only 12 people so so that's that's like the base of kind of the the book itself, right? Like a memoir of doing that process over a long time, but it's not, my goal from this beginning was not just like another adventures book where it's like, then I went and did this amazing thing. And then I went to this mountain and then, you know, it was more, it's more of a story of the crazy, uh, amazing, sad, tragic stuff that's happened along the way. And these stories that I've been very close and involved with accidents and these things that kind of paint a better like narrative along the way to show what that journey has been like. And it's Mm -hmm. not just, then I got to the top of this peak and here's a summit picture. Um, So writing that I've thought a lot about, you know, we're, yeah, avalanches have been unfortunately played a big part of life for me over 10, 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, not necessarily like always being in an avalanche or being directly affected by it, but you know, the, the ripple effect or in, in circles of people I know sure. and rescues sure. and people dying and then right. it affecting your life and all this mm-hmm. other stuff. Um, and so Eric Larson, actually, he always calls me the luckiest unlucky guy he knows. Yeah. That's because, the article I read. Yeah. Because I've I've somehow been around a lot of these big accidents and tragedies, but just been either there and like helped out on a rescue, or been on the periphery, or didn't go on a trip last minute because of something yeah. that happened. That's and true. then, so it's like, yeah, I mean, it's crazy to think, but. So, um, I don't know it. Yeah. And even, 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 even stuff like the Everest earthquake in 15, um, you know, that, crazy. that, yeah, that, that avalanche, you, you know, we were there with a group and it came right through base camp and we were in base camp. Yeah. We just come down from camp one the day before. And, um, and, and our camp is luckily situated pretty high up on the, in relation to the base camp and the that thing went right through the center and basically like one camp below us all their tents were leveled but ours was like i think our shower tent got knocked over or something you know um so and and so so i can think back and look at pomori where that that big serac came off Mm-hmm. And I remember I, I climbed that the route that goes around that thing in 2003. It was my first Himalayan mountain was climbing Pomori. Um, and so it's like all these little tie-ins of, of things. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been quite a journey with yeah. close calls and all kinds of crazy stories. And I mean, even the, even the K2 2008 um, big tragedy when the Serac collapsed in the bottleneck and you know that i was supposed to be there um i was on a permit for that that year i had gone in 2006 um but we turned around just below the camp four it was just like a bad weather season a bunch bunch of reasons we turned but but i was supposed to be there again in eight i was on a permit i got a cold injury on my big toe in the spring um and it was starting to turn some funny colors and I was like, well, 
I guess that means I'm not going to K2. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, you know, then all the people I would have been with, the lucky that man. accident happens. I mean, uh, Will Coban Rujan was a partner of mine in 2006. He, you know, was above the collapse and lost all his toes. Jared McDonald was on my team in 2006. He passed away, unfortunately. Um, even Cecilia, um, her husband died, Rolf. Um, and so that, that scenario and, the, and those people, you know, then years later played a role in my life again, because then I'm, you know, I got to know Cecilia and we went on polar ski trips and then I went and did a crossing with her. And then later we were uh, in a relationship and all these, it's like all these things are a strange circle that just come back in the community and, and uh, have an effect on your, on your life adventure wise and personal. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a life is fragile. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of that, um, you're, you're headed back to Everest. You're, you're, you're leaving tomorrow. Um, we're probably running out of time here, but we want to talk to you a little bit about that. We want to we want to hopefully catch up with you, depending upon how your schedule is when you're when you're off Everest, and do a wrap up, do an Everest wrap up where you can sort of give us a, you know, it won't be long, but maybe we can if we get time, we can do a short interview with you and and just do a quick brief on your season, and yeah, give, give you a bit of pump for what might be happening next. So yeah, absolutely. Catch, yeah. And uh, we want to thank you for your time and uh, showing, teaching us and giving us all the great perspectives and uh, sharing your experiences with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. No problem. Thank, thank you so much for having me on here. And uh, good to see you over there living the dream on the boat. <laughs> yeah, man. Getting, getting, getting into different adventures on, on the water. And uh, yeah, I look forward to catching up with you later. Yeah. yeah, so good luck with you and your team, uh, hoping for success, and uh, we'll definitely be following you, and when we get the show done, we'll have, uh, I, I, I create a page for you, and I'll try and link in as much stuff as I can so people can also follow through the page, but we'll be right. following you and uh, definitely giving some updates about your trip to our audience. Awesome. Thanks a lot, and best of luck in the springtime there. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> Let's keep working. You too. Yeah. Good yeah. luck. Good luck. All the best. Prayers and best wishes. Yeah, dishes. we've got a few. We got a few friends up on the mountain right now. They're laying some of the ropes for you. Some of our good friends are yeah. nice. Yeah, helping out as well. So uh, enjoy your time. Take care. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate you, your time. Take care. Bye. Bye.